mention hospitality? What, what do they mean? What's wrapped up in that? I, I, this is not the only thing to say, but I think it's helpful to define hospitality. Um, very literally, the, in the New Testament written in Greek, the word hospitality literally means love for outsiders or love for strangers. And that certainly means strangers who live in your city and you have no idea who they are, but it extends even a little closer than that. It extends to people who don't live in your household, outside of your immediate family and friends. It's a love for outsiders. And this was especially important in the, in the cultures of the Old and New Testament because there's one thing we certainly take for granted, I do. Um, if you needed to travel in the ancient world, if you needed to go even a village or two over, who do you stay with? You know, if, if you're like me, you assume, well, I'm sure there's an Airbnb for that. You know? I'm sure there's a, a hotel or a motel if need be, but, but very simply, those things either did not exist in the cultures we're talking about or were very seedy. Uh, if you were to travel in the ancient world, and remember, God in the Old Covenant calls his people to travel from all over Israel to Jerusalem several times throughout the year. So you could say that the Jewish people, God's people, were called to be a traveling people. They were constantly, throughout the year, having to travel. And, but in order to do that, you needed to know some people. Because otherwise you're sleeping out under the stars. And when we see stories of that happening in the, in the Old Testament, of, of people traveling and, and not having a family relationship or not having a friendship with someone in the place they're traveling and having to sleep outside. It, it, it mattered if you live in this town and you want to travel to this town it mattered that you already knew somebody there or that you could just assume somebody in this new town would put you up for a night or for a while. And, and even as the concept of inns or, or places to pay money to stay the night, as, as those become to be a thing that exists, and especially in the Greco-Roman world, um, they had a terrible reputation. An absolutely terrible reputation. First off, it was a shame that they had to exist. The existence of an inn was proof that the people in that town did not love outsiders well enough. This whole business exists because the people here evidently are not hospitable enough to outsiders. But secondly, inns from ancient times on had a terrible reputation. They were seen as filthy places. They were the site of illegal activities involving uh, men and women doing grown-up stuff together, um, just like they kind of have that reputation sometimes today. But, but thirdly, inns were just physically dangerous places where oftentimes guests were robbed by brigands and thieves. And so society depended on strangers loving each other well. Not even in an explicitly religious way, just there needed to be an understanding that people looked out for each other even in putting each other up. That's why if you go outside the world of the New Testament, but you look at ancient Greek mythology, so many stories of Greek mythology are full of stories where people either welcome strangers who are actually the Greek gods and get blessed for it, or people not welcoming strangers who it turns out are Greek gods and who are cursed for it. Now, certainly there are stories, the curses come from mistreating people who pass by and need some help. But sometimes the Greek gods, and again, this represents the culture and how we think about things, the Greek gods would curse people for just ignoring them, not being cruel or rude, but to ignore a potential guest, to overlook someone who probably needed your help a place to stay, something to eat and drink. To ignore them was considered highly rude. Check this out. This isn't just an ancient times thing in the world of the Bible. This continues well into the Middle Ages. In fact, our Protestant forefathers and foremothers, people living, you know, only 500 years before now, 400 years before now, during the Reformation, many Protestant leaders criticized society as a whole because ends continued to exist. And again, you only need an inn in a city if the people there are not very hospitable. It wasn't because they were dirty and dangerous, which they often still were, but it's because their existence 
was proof that the Christians in town did not love guests. Here's John Calvin writing. Uh, He's commenting on a passage in Genesis chapter 18 where Abraham welcomes three mysterious men to his tent. And it turns out in some mysterious way that Genesis doesn't explicitly describe, in some way those three men either represented the Lord, maybe as his angels. Um, In this commentary on on Genesis, uh, John Calvin writes, the great number of inns in the 1600s in his day was evidence of our depravity. Ends, he says, prove that the principal duty of humanity has become obsolete among us. Quick pause there. Pastor, theologian, you don't have to love John Calvin. You don't have to like very much of what he says. But did you see what he just called hospitality? Hospitality, according to him, is the principal duty of humanity. Our love for outsiders. If we can use Jesus' language, our love for neighbors. His criticism was it's become obsolete in the 15 and 1600s. Maybe if you've gotten the opportunity to um, experience uh, traveling to other cultures or maybe here in Effingham meeting people who grew up in other cultures, maybe you've experienced some ways that around the world today non-Christians often shame us in their practice of hospitality. I've I've told the story before for a short time I lived in Southeast Asia um, doing work to share the good news of Jesus and um, I made a good friend, a single man who lived by himself. He was a student at the university, and he invited me over to his house. Um, and I went to his house, which was very, by, by American standards, very run down, very poor quality. Um, it, it seemed like it was a dangerous part of town. Um, but as we walked together into his home, he sat me on a cushion on the ground, which was the, the cleanest thing in the entire room, and he would not let me leave for hours. And this single man, stuffed my face. I I couldn't leave because he kept making me eat. And we would finish one course and he would serve serve me another course. And he was fascinated to hear about my life story and uh, how I was doing and what I thought about living in his country and all these things. It was, it was, have you ever been, maybe, maybe Thanksgiving week is when you experienced this. Have you ever had so many good things set in front of you food wise, but also such good conversation for so long? At some point, you feel rude saying, I hate to say it, but I got to go. That, that, that was my experience and one of many experiences like that living in this country in Southeast Asia. Um, there are certainly other countries like that famous for that kind of hospitality in uh, the Middle East today or in North Africa. Um, all of that was because there's an assumption. No one even has to explicitly teach you like this. It's just how you grow up that when someone is an outsider, you bend over backwards to welcome them in to your life and to, and to serve them, to, to give them above and beyond good gifts. It's just sort of assumed that's what you do. Now, that's not the only way to share hospitality. Let's say that up front. We'll talk more about that. But let's also understand that in some ways, the Bible expects us to see how God in his common grace has revealed hospitality to the world, to people who are darkened in their understanding, they don't know the good news of Jesus, or they outright reject it. For us as as people who have been forgiven and brought out of darkness into the light of Jesus, for us to look at that way of life, at that way of sharing our resources and our time and our energy, and to say, if Jesus has not transformed these people's hearts yet, and yet they still love outsiders so well. Here's, Here's a very important way of Paul's thinking in the New Testament. If all that's true, how much more? How much more should those of us who have been transformed by grace, who have been brought into God's family from the outside, who have been lavishly treated, not only in this life, but in the life to come, who have been loved with an everlasting love, if all that's true of our friends who don't yet know Jesus, how much more should we and can we, in the power of Jesus, love outsiders? This is really important for us when we start to read the New Testament through that lens because if you, look at, if you look at the New Testament through the lens of where do I see hospitality? If you put your hospitality glasses on, you will see it everywhere. For example, um, we can look at this tiny little um, post-it note letter of 3 John. 3 John is, you don't even need to know chapters because it's one chapter long. Um, 3 John is just a, a collection of a small number of verses, but in 3 John we see the, the writer 
telling a local church to host traveling missionaries and to host them generously. So this is from 3 John, starting in verse 5. Beloved, it's a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers and sisters, strangers as they are. Y'all don't know them. They testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. Let's pause there. I wonder what that would look like, to send traveling missionaries on in a way that's in a manner worthy of God. Because, going back to verse 7 of 3 John, because they have gone out for the sake of the name. Accepting nothing from the Gentiles, very ironically, he's almost certainly writing to people who ethnically are Gentiles. Gentile, in the writer's mind, is not really an ethnic racial thing. It's much more of a religious You're either in because of Jesus or you're not yet in because you don't follow Jesus. They've accepted nothing from unbelievers, from the Gentiles. Therefore, the writer says, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. So even in our missionary giving, for example, financially, but also hosting folks, can I say this, reaching out to them through all the crazy technological ways that we can in our world today to say, hey, I know you're still on the other side of the world, but man, I would still love to have a conversation. How are you doing? How's your work going? As much as you're able to talk about it electronically. Um, How can I be praying for you? Again, welcoming other people into your life. And then as, as best as you can, sending them on their way with encouragement, with financial support, with prayers, in the, not only the culture of the New Testament, but in the life of the first Christians, hospitality was a big honking deal. So we don't have to guess even, as we, we can see more examples, we don't have to guess at what hospitality in the Bible looks like. We have so many examples. I'm just going to do a flyover <laughs> of some of these because I want to leave time for good discussion. But here's a handful, here's a selection of verses in the New Testament that help us at one Savior see if we're going to follow Jesus together, We don't have a choice. We have got to love outsiders, outsiders to our own homes, but also outsiders to the faith. We have got to love them very well. The first example I can think of is Romans chapter 15. I think all these should be on your handouts. But Romans 15, Paul is wrapping up what we often consider to be a great theological treatise, and certainly the letter to the Romans is. But honestly, the letter to the Romans is a missionary support letter with an extremely long introduction. That's what the letter to the Romans is. Paul's essentially asking for money so that he can take it to some other Christians in need. And he happens to write some of the most profound theology ever as kind of his introduction. But as he's wrapping the letter up in Romans 15, he starts, he says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, not to please ourselves. Let each of us build his neighbor for his good, to build him up. Sorry, let let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. Because Christ didn't please himself. But as it's written, the reproaches of those who reproached you, God, fell on me. For whatever was written in former days in the Old Testament was written for our, in the New Testament, instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together y'all may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's all of his background. Now look at verse 7. If you want to glorify the Father of Jesus Christ, the one true God, if you want to love each other well, what's, what's the bottom line, Paul? Verse 7. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Now let me tell you, that's one of my favorite passages in the New Testament, so I'm, I'm tempted real hard to start preaching. But let me just make a, a couple of very brief points about that passage. One, hospitality is all about doing hard things for the sake of people who haven't earned it. For the sake of people who have not earned it. It's an act of love and of grace. That's what we're seeing here. That's, that's what he explicitly says, but then even if he didn't say it, then he, bright, he points out to say at the beginning of the passage and at the end, let's welcome each other like Jesus has welcomed us. 
Let's, let's bend over backwards to welcome folks like we talked about a minute ago. But let's do it for folks who, they haven't earned it. They're never going to pay us back. And we're not doing it to please ourselves just because I happen to love hospitality. I'm the life of the party kind of person. No, that's not why we welcome folks. But to Im- imitate Christ's sacrifice. The, the cost he paid in order to welcome us. The cost he paid for God to be glorified as we endure, as we are welcomed into this family. Hospitality, in, in one sense, is just about copying God. We could say that for the whole Christian life, couldn't we? But hospitality is one way we're just copying God by doing hard things for the eternal joy of other people. That's the Christian life, and hospitality is part of it. Whatever we do to welcome outsiders, we have to do it very simply because, according to the scriptures, there's no other way to follow Jesus. There's no other way to look in the mirror and call yourself a Christian if this is not something that we're growing in, that we're, if we're, when we're failing, we're repenting of it. When we're sincerely working together to get better at it. Yeah, Trolton. Is that really the way we should look at it? Tell me more. And that's the, that's the balance. I think both of y'all are right. Neither of y'all are contradicting each other. Just to repeat for the sake of the, for the, sake of the recording, Charlton's bringing out the great point that, like, isn't this a delight? Don't, should, ought, we, ought this be something we love to do because we love other people? That is 100% correct. And Sue, I believe, is 100% correct. Um, it might, you know, my experience, my, my longer-term friendships with folks who grew up in cultures where hospitality was a big deal, it actually can be a burden. Financially, but resource-wise, uh, it, it, let me put it like this. It is both a delight and a duty. And sometimes if the Christian life is a train, the, the engine driving the train, we love it. It's so much more pleasurable when um, the locomotive is delight. I'm, doing, I'm following Jesus and obeying him because I love it. Duty is always one of the cars. Sometimes duty has to be the locomotive pulling the rest of it along because we, for whatever reason we don't feel the delight. We don't want to live there too long because the duty car, now we're really breaking down the metaphor, the duty car doesn't have a ton of fuel. It can't go very far if you're only doing something out of sheer duty. But the good news of the gospel is duty often becomes delight. We often grow as we love Jesus, like we talked about in last week's sermon, as we step into suffering and doing hard things for Jesus, with Jesus, we often find that duty becomes a delight. But so, so they don't cancel each other out. I don't even want to say one's more important than the other. But especially in terms of hospitality, we do have a duty to love outsiders. And especially as we practice and experience it, I think we often do find, whether you're an extrovert or an introvert or whatever, that there's something about hospitality that we really can delight in. Spike. And just to try to sum up a little bit of what you said, Spike, because that was very helpful. I I just wish for the sake of time I could repeat it word for word. Um, And what you said makes me think of Jesus' words. 
On the one hand, he calls us slaves. We are servants, bond servants of God. But you remember what he says on the last night, on the night that he's betrayed, no longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends. And I think both of those are true of the Christian life. And they never, the writers of the Bible never, they never explain it as if those two things were butting heads. They're both true at the same time. And so here's, let's actually move on to the next passage where we see that same thing played out, where both the duty to show hospitality and the delight of showing hospitality are very real. Read, Read 1 Peter 4 or follow along with me. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Okay, time out. Peter is saying the world's going to end at any given time. Christ will return when he will. The end of all things, from our experience, is always right in front of us. So kind of instructions for the end times. Should we be locking ourselves in a prayer closet and abandoning our families and jobs? Should we be hoarding food? You know, what, what, what should you do if you know the world's going to end at any given time? Well, first off, um, compare the way you live with the way with which you offer your prayers. Be, be sober-minded and self-controlled for the sake of your prayers. Secondly, he says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Thirdly, if you know the world's supposed to end, what, how should you live? Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And because Peter can't help himself but prays, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we saw in Romans, the Apostle Paul saying that we copy God's hospitality by welcoming fellow brothers and sisters into our lives. And we got to do that. We, we can't help but do that as people who ourselves have been welcomed into God's family in Jesus Christ. But look at verse 9 here. Hospitality really is a commandment. Um, specifically, the fact that Christ will return means that we must show hospitality to one another, to other Christians especially our our fellow members in a congregation. Remember, we're really laying the foundation for what church membership looks like. And Peter says it matters how we show hospitality, not begrudgingly. That's, you know, Charlton, what you're rightly warning of is, well, I guess i got to have somebody over. You know, the Eeyore hospitality. We're not begrudging that. Even though, to Sue's point, it often is very difficult for various reasons, to have someone into our lives, especially as we're drawing closer and closer to them. It will cost us relationally. It will cost us financially, time, energy, all that kind of stuff. But we are to show... Isn't that carrying you, Is it? it well, uh, it is a... We have the perfect example of someone who, out of love, did a hard thing for somebody else, especially at the cross. And in light of that, we can repent ourselves of, of complaining about hospitality. Um, We don't have to do it with grumbling, but instead we can do it willingly and joyfully. Um, And so we must, but also to Charlton's point, we can because of the spirit at work within us and because of the Jesus who has blazed the trail in front of us. Let's, again, I told you we're flying. Let's fly. Next passage. Um, Here are both passages in the New Testament explaining what an elder must be. This is a very interesting job description. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. When you and I apply for work, uh, we often say, you know, here, here's five, seven duties you're primarily responsible for. Do you recognize that Paul sort of assumes the churches will know what an elder does? And so the job description, with only one exception, has nothing to do with what an elder does. It's about who an elder is in their character, and their heart. Let's read just a few verses from 1 Timothy. The saying's trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer... Remember, we understand, we, we see Paul uses the word overseer and pastor and elder interchangeably. In him, they're talking about the same job. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above approach. You want to do a noble thing, brother? You must be a noble kind of person. What, is, what, is it noble, what does a noble person look like? Well, they're above approach. Just in general, you can sling stuff at them, and because they're sinners, some of it will stick. But in general, when you throw accusations at an elder, or the kind of person who's an elder, it shouldn't stick. What are some kinds of ways that elders can't be accused of anything in good conscience? What kind of person are we looking for? 
Well, they're the husband of one wife. They're sober-minded. They're self-controlled. They're respectable. They are hospitable. They're able to teach. Okay, there's the one and only thing elders are called, specifically, they must be able to do. But they're also not drunks, and they're not violent, but instead they're gentle. They're not quarrelsome. They're not people who pick fights, and they don't love money. You know, he's, in that letter, First Timothy, Paul is writing to a man he knows really well, to a, a congregation of people who apparently have a pretty deep background knowledge of the Old Testament. Now let's look at the letter to Titus. Paul knows Titus less well. Titus is on the island of Crete, which is famously pagan, famously opposed to anything looking like Old Testament religion. What changes for Titus? You know, as, as, as Paul sends Titus to plant churches, to raise up leaders in those churches, he says in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, I sent you to the island of Crete to appoint elders. That's your job, Titus. So, okay, Titus, what kind of guys are you looking for to be overseers or pastors of Jesus' church? An overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. Your context does not change the need for the right kind of person to be in this role. Well, what does it mean to be above reproach? He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent, and he can't be greedy for gain. But what's the first thing he tells Titus a pastor has to be or an elder of a church has to be? Instead, verse 8, he must be hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined. How do members of a church grow in hospitality? Scripture gives us a bunch of answers. But I think I could boil it down to two categories. How, how, do we get, how do we become more hospitable in our character? We, our hearts desire to welcome outsiders. And then actually, how do we play it out? I think, one, we do it by knowing God's Word. God's Word helps us and shows us and motivates us. But secondly, we need, apparently, in our lives, we need real flesh and blood people to copy. They certainly don't have to be elders of a church. But in the same way that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, we need people we can imitate in the way that they imitate Christ. We need real flesh and blood men and women to see in our lives. And so why is it required for an elder to be hospitable? Of all the things an elder must be, why hospitable? I think it's because this. We need people who lead us through service, in prayer, in handling God's word, not to be bullies who separate themselves and they kind of have like the holy huddle you know, the men in, in, the, in the smoky rooms making all the decisions behind closed doors. Instead, we want our leaders to be people who welcome us all into their lives. Because the way that they treat their kids and the way that they deal with their money and the way that they treat their calendar and the way they use their time, we want to be able to say, okay, their situation's a little different from mine, so I, I probably can't copy it exactly, but on the, you know, driving home, I, we're talking in the car. Man, I really, did, you, did you notice the way that like, um, without saying anything, he got up and took our plates and he went over to the sink so that, his, so that his wife could keep having the conversation she was in? Or, or did you notice the way that um, we prayed at the dinner table for foreign missionaries that our church supports? Did you notice that he was the one who reached out to us and said, hey, can you have dinner with us sometime? There's no agenda. I just want to get to know you better. Listen, this is not just an ancient, near, an ancient culture thing. That is becoming rarer and rarer in our time. And so for someone in our lives, but most especially our church's chief teachers, our, our, our church's chief prayers, for those to be the people who are showing us how to be hospitable. Because when we think about it, that's nothing fancy. They're just doing what Jesus does and inviting us in. That's the kind of thing that will trickle down to everyone else's lives so that we can show hospitality to our non-Christian neighbors and co-workers. The danger is, and this is something I've, I've heard in, in, in pastoral training, but I've also seen it and proven it true in my own life, um, the spiritual maturity of a church will never exceed the spiritual maturity of its elders. We will imitate our elders one way or another. And so if our elders never pray, we will not really be a praying church if our elders never welcome outsiders into their lives. We won't either, and we won't even know we're not because it's not something our church talks about. So do, do as, you're, as you're praying for the elders of one Savior, as you're praying for your own life, do pray that we would meet all of the Bible's qualifications, including that we would be the kind of people who in various ways welcome outsiders into our lives.
Why does that matter so much? So that if the Spirit does good things like he is wont to do, as the Spirit matures the elders of our church, and as that trickles down more and more into the lives of every member of our church, that ends up affecting non-Christians. Again, we're showing hospitality to each other, but as we just get used to being hospitable people, that can't help but spill over into the lives of non-believing children in our lives, um, to next-door neighbors and coworkers, to extended family who don't know the Lord. We can't help as our hearts are changed, we can't help but find ways to at least invite them into our lives so that outsiders more and more become insiders to our lives. And I, can I say this? I, I'm going to make a bold statement here. I'm willing, I'm willing to make an overstatement that I have to walk back later, but I think it's basically accurate, so check me on this. I think hospitality is our chief tool for evangelism. If by hospitality I mean, first off, I have a heart that cares about people outside my immediate circle of concern. I just care about them. If I love people outside of my immediate family and friend group, that's going to change me. I can't help then but to begin to pray for folks. And when I think about who Jesus is and what eternity without him is and what life right now is like without him, I'm going to become more and more the kind of person who prays for the lost to be saved. And as the Spirit works in me, I can't help but then become someone who says, well, I've been praying for the non-Christians in my life for like three years now, and no one's shown up to share the gospel with them. I guess maybe it's me. <laughs> I guess maybe I'm the one who gets to develop a real friendship with them. They're not projects to check off a list. I just, I care about them. I want to be a genuine friend to them, whether or not they ever become Christians. But let me tell you up front, my main desire for everyone in my life and everyone in the world is to become a Christian because that's just the best thing that could happen to them. And it brings them out of the worst thing that could ever happen to them. So yeah, whether you follow Jesus or not, um, I'm going to be your friend. But please do know, my friendship at the heart of it is a desire for you to follow Jesus too. Let me simply point out one more passage of Scripture where I see, we see the heart of Jesus in that way. In a surprising way. This is from Luke chapter 14. Um, one of my very favorite parables from any of the Gospels. Jesus is at a dinner party with religious leaders. So, you know, imagine a church potluck or like an elder's potluck. Elders, deacons, small group leaders, you know, the real leaders of the church. And Jesus tells a story that embarrasses them. He's sitting at the dinner table and he says, when you give a dinner or a banquet, like you're doing right now, don't invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest, why not? Because there's the threat. The threat is if you invite them people, they will invite you in return and you'll get repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed because they can't repay you. Jesus completely flips our understanding of how math works. And how logic works. The blessing is because you won't be repaid in this life. You will be repaid instead, he says, at the resurrection of the just. Hospitality, according to Jesus, is more than just spending time with fellow church members and people you get along with. If we're talking Jesus' hospitality, we're talking ways to initiate friendships with difficult people. People who are very different from us, people who can't repay us, who maybe are, they have a very different life story than us. And so when we're thinking about how do we initiate friendships with them, so many things come to mind. But first, think about your calendar. It's often been said you can tell someone's real priorities by their checkbook, but we don't ever write checks anymore. I don't remember the last time, it's been a minute since I wrote one. So instead of thinking about your priorities based on your checkbook, think about your priorities based on your calendar. Because I, I, I'm brave enough to say I think our calendars right now are in some ways squeezed even tighter than our checkbooks. Who do you spend your time with? And who, with, with the, the free time that you have, not all of us, we, we don't have perfectly free schedules, but in the free time that you have, how are you using at least some of it to befriend new people? Especially new people you would never hang out with apart from Jesus. 
It's a real, a real challenge to our heart. But if we want to show hospitality like Jesus, it's something worth praying through. Jesus, what would that look like for me? I just, I love you. I want to do what you say. I want to be like you. So what would it look like for me to initiate new friendships with people like that? And you fill in the blank as to what that is. Yeah, Charlton. Yeah, I will, unsurprisingly, y'all knowing me and my love of history and Charlton's as well, uh, I, will, I will go to the mat. I will wrestle people to convince them that Santa Claus is not nearly as cool as the real Saint Nick. Saint Nicholas of Mira in Turkey was the man, particularly in his love and his hospitality toward the poor. Let's take a few minutes now to break up. We've, we've looked at several passages of Scripture. Um... We throw out some really big ideas, and I, I think we need some time, like, like a good Thanksgiving feast, we need some time to digest before we move on to the next course. Or like a really cruddy Chinese buffet, which I'm addicted to personally. Um, I know I'm going to go back for another plate, but I just need to let this sit for a minute. So before we move on to anything else, um, let's take a few minutes and just break up. We're all adults. You can, well, actually, we're not all adults, but let's break up in small-ish groups, and let's just ask ourselves one question. Not everyone, in here, not everyone in here is a member of One Savior, though most of us are. So let's think about this. Let's take three minutes. I'll watch the clock. How, how can we as members of One Savior show hospitality to other members of One Savior during the week? Sundays, but also outside. So how can, how, how can we, because there's a million different ways, how can we show hospitality to other members of the church. Let's take a few minutes to think about that, and I'll sum it up when the time's up.
All right. All right. Flash round is over. I know that was hardly enough time to even say howdy. You can stay in your seats if you want because I'm going to ask another question in a minute. But let's just shout some stuff out. Um, because there's, there's easy ways, there's hard ways, and there's some ways that would only work in certain situations. But in no particular order, just shout them out. What are some ways we can show hospitality toward other Christians at One Savior? Invite people to dinner. Invite people to dinner. Spike, Spike coming in with the low-hanging fruit. So if, anyone, if any of you were waiting for the easy answer, Spike stole it. Invite to dinner. What else? What are, what are some other ways? Sure. Invite them to church. If this is Family Feud, y'all are getting the top two answers right up front. What? Phone and email. I'm going to throw in texts too. Phone, email. Yeah, that's, that's a very low energy, low cost way just to say, hey, I care about you. How you doing? What else? Visit somebody. Yeah, because there are some folks who can't, they can't do really any of these things. Yeah. Visit, yeah, it, you know, in some ways... You might think, that's making them show hospitality, right? Because they're, they're the ones, they got to host you. But actually, that's a, that's, that's a way of including them in your life. That you're reaching out to them. Yeah, that's great. What else? There's, there's no quote I'm going for, but there's, I came up with like 15. So I had more time, though. So <laughs> Facebook, social media. Somebody said my greatest ministry in life is liking everything I see on Facebook, which I don't like everything, but I do like a lot of things. Hey, there we go. Holidays together. Let me tell y'all, as somebody who for 20 years now has lived away from where I grew up and I really don't have immediate family around, um, the holidays are often very lonely for me and for a lot of other folks who, if you didn't grow up here. And so having having shared many holidays with other people in their homes. And now, actually, my, 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 let, me, let me praise God for my in-laws. Chelsea's parents have always been so great at this. I don't remember ever having Thanksgiving or Christmas with them when there weren't other people in the home. They're, they're, they're believers, and they love welcoming in international folks or just folks from church. So they, they set that example that is now rippling down into my family too. So what are some others? Let's get three more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, I'm going to, I would, just for the sake of getting more, I'm going to say, I'm going to throw that up here, writing a letter. Let's get three, three distinct. It is old-fashioned. I completely agree, but I'm still going to make it not its own thing. What are three, what are three other ways? I know, I'm, I'm a meanie. Hey, give... A ride. Two more. Oh, helping people move. Hey, offer to serve. As a, as a guy with four young kids, if you want to babysit me, that is the best way to welcome me in your life. I meant to say babysit my kids. Did I say babysit me? Uh, babysit for me. We could keep throwing those out. Um, let me, let, me, let me throw out one more question with the time we have left. I'm pretty sure all of these would also work really well for non-Christians. Okay? Right? I, I, very few of those are going to be like, completely different. So let's take another two and a half minutes to think about what are some other ways. Let's keep brainstorming. Uh, and may, maybe some of them might be specific toward non-Christians in our lives. This might get very specific for our particular circumstances. But what are some ways we can welcome in into our lives, into our hearts, but also practically into our lives, people who don't follow Jesus yet? Two and a half minutes, go. Oh, you got to brainstorm first, Mary. But bra- Mary, throw it a good one. I'm going to put that up there, but y'all keep talking. Talk. Okay, now go. Two minutes, 15 seconds.
All right, I wish I could give you five more minutes, but we ain't got it. So we ain't got five more minutes. So what are some ways we can show hospitality toward non-Christians? And again, that can be on Sundays, but also Monday through Saturday. Oh, they're, 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 they're posting Sue up. Okay, Sue, what you got for us? Okay. Yes. Yes, yeah. I would encourage you, as somebody else has said, Steve, uh, the Lord Jesus loved prostitutes, but he did not go to the breakfast buffet inside the strip club. Um, so, but yet going to events just out of love for them, going to see a concert or going to, yeah, Christian. One more time. Sharing testimony. Yeah, just saying, hey man, can I, I actually trust you. Can I tell you like a really personal story about my life that really matters to me? Because I, I want you to hear that. Yeah, that's good. Do you see already, uh, that's a great example, Christian, of how Sometimes, what's the difference between hospitality and evangelism? Sometimes it's kind of hard to tell. Well, what, are, what are a couple more? Yeah. Can I, can, I, can I just summarize it in saying, letting them know you better? Yeah. Finding common interests yeah yes take interest in them that's a very important one anything else I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat a little bit I'm gonna say I've already kind of mentioned this before but pray for them like I'm, I'm I actually I'm inviting them into my life by thinking about them and then pouring out my heart to God. That's a, that's a very important part of hospitality. Um, uh, I, I'll, I'll say this. As a guy who's super unhandy in real life, this is some of the, in retrospect, some of the best hospitality I ever showed. This is, I, I think about the story of Jesus at, at the well with the Samaritan woman. Um, ask for their help. Hey man, can I borrow a hammer drill? Or, uh, hey, do you have a cup of sugar? Or, hey, I've never repaired a fence like this before. Do you, like, have, like, and, and again, not, not treating it as a project, but genuinely opening up and saying, hey, I, I, I'm not being cute to here. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, or I really do need this. And out of that, maybe we can build a better relationship that turns into a friendship. Um, what are these other things? But again, uh, it, it, it's not, talking about Jesus is absolutely the goal. That is very hospitable. You're welcoming them into God's family. But then sometimes with some folks, we might serve for years and years. And in retrospect, we say it was two steps forward, one step back in that relationship. But over time, I got to the point where they actually, they would know when I share my testimony with them that I'm not just like treating them like a project. Like actually, I'm, I'm telling them my story because I genuinely love them. And again, if they don't accept Jesus right now or maybe even ever, I'm still their friend. I want to be one of their best champions in life. I'm going to help them. I'm going to be a great neighbor to them. I'm always going to do everything. But it's not contingent upon them following Jesus. I just want them in my life. They're an outsider, but I want to welcome them in. Spike. I believe that, see, if they, if they know where you stand in Christ, if something, you know, goes wrong with them or something, they know they can come to you. That's right. You know? That's right. Or if they got a question about something like that, you know, that, that bothers them. You know, they got someone in their life that they can meet. That's right. We're, we're building the foundation with other folks so that they can understand, even if I think she's a religious wacko, she's actually pretty kind. <laughs> and I will open up my needs to them. But, you know, let's, let's stop for now because, you know, every Sunday what, what we do, I think if we, look, if we look at our worship gatherings through this lens, I think it's perfectly accurate to say every Sunday we go to our dad's house for Sunday lunch. Um, he welcomes us every week, even though during the week we have not been very good sons and daughters. Um, but he doesn't just once when we walk an aisle or pray a prayer welcome us. He welcomes us over and over and over again. Not because he needs anything from us, but he just loves us. And he loves us being in his presence with him and the rest of the family, at least in this, in this congregation's membership. And so we get to ex experience the hospitality of God every time we gather together in his name. So let's pray not only that we would understand that and we would grow from that. Could, could we pray this morning that we would enjoy that? That, that we would emotionally experience the love of God as we gather together. Let's pray.
Father, Son, and Spirit, that is what we want. You have welcomed us in. You have adopted us into your family in Jesus Christ alone. There's no way we could force ourselves into your family. There's no way we could pay you off or pay you back. You love us with a great heart of love. And now we get to be your representatives in the world. We get to love people who don't deserve it any more than we do. Um, And we get to teach the good news of Jesus in a way that would persuade them to follow you if you help it. Um, Lord, we long for that to happen more and more with more and more people. But we come to you first as very needy people whose tanks are empty, who need you very much. And so would you please, Lord, not only intellectually and not only in a way that motivates us to serve with our bodies, but in our emotions and our hearts this morning, Lord, would you please make us to feel your pleasure in us, in Jesus? Would you make us to feel your love for us and your acceptance of us in Jesus? Would you make us to encounter you in a way that is deeply encouraging and deeply motivating and deeply practical for us as we become more like you. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.